Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. I hope you're having a great day at home, and I'm so sorry the weather is so bad. Uh, we wanted to keep everybody safe, but man, we're glad we get to be together in this capacity today and, uh, and celebrate Jesus and worship him and continue on in our growth. I want to let you know a couple things. Number one, like ladies, I'm so excited about Rise coming up this Friday. Man, I hope every woman that calls Mid Cities home is there. Um, it's bring some friends. It's going to be a powerful night of worship and encouragement. I believe it's going to bless you. It's going to be a great time. And I also want to just say, here in a couple of weeks, we have Pastor Jim Lafoon coming to visit us. Want to let you know uh, on the 28th of February, he's going to be joining us uh, and uh, going to be preaching. And he's always um, just such a he's he's not. Just to guest. He's really a part of our family. We love it when he comes to bring that prophetic word um, that the Lord's put on his heart. So he's going to be sharing that on the 28th. We'd love for you to come. Uh, and here we'll be back next week, of course, live. And uh, just to what's coming in the few next few weeks is we have a series on Ruth. We're going to be going through the Old Testament book of Ruth for several weeks leading up to Easter. So you can kind of prepare. Maybe if you want to start reading the book of Ruth, it's going to be helpful for you. Uh, dive in already. So, uh, man, I know that this is going to be a great day. It's Valentine's Day. Um, but uh, today I want to finish up our series on the elements of revival. We've been talking about different elements of revival that, that bring about a real move of God. And as I was praying about today, I'm convinced that it's, it's essential uh, for us to experience all that God wants us to experience and pour out his spirit and do great things in Odessa, Midland, at Mid-Cities, among my family and your family then it's going to require a unity of spirit. And that's the element I want to talk about today, unity of spirit among followers of Jesus Christ. Not a unity among spirit among all humanity. I'm talking about unity of spirit among everyone who calls Jesus their Lord and Savior. And that's what I want to dive into today because it seems like everything in the world is trying to divide us, doesn't it? I mean, this last year has been replete with examples of, 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 of problems and issues and things that have tried to divide, not just the world, but even Christians. Uh, there's been a, a, a political, this has been a political year, right? There's been uh, the, the donkey on one side, the elephant on the other, and then various versions of both of those and, uh, and an unusual election cycle that has caused so much angst in not just people out there, but people in here, people within the church, the big C church. Uh, this has not just been an election year, it's been COVID-19. Uh, unprecedented has been used one, more than one occasion. Our family laughs about it, how often people use the word unprecedented. Um, but this pandemic that has, that has boiled over, not just in America, but also globally uh, has been real. And, and it's tried to divide us, right? On the political side, you've got liberal and conservative and the various versions of that. On the, on the COVID side, you have mask wearers and no mask wearers. Uh, you have the, the shutdown people and the no shutdown people. Then you have the hoax. This is completely a hoax. This, this isn't even a real thing. And then there's the, this is the end of the world, I think. And, 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 and there's various extremes. Those are the extremes and everything in between. But it's not just that. There was this last year, there was the ethnic tensions that our country dealt with that, that boiled over into violent riots at times in various places in the United States. Um, and and uh, there was extremes in this way. There was those that said race isn't an issue anymore and other people that say uh, race is everywhere and, and there's a whole bunch of folks in between and all of it causing some division in some ways. News has been a space of division, right? There's, remember the good old days when like Fox News was supposed to be conservative and CNN was liberal and now supposedly Fox is liberal too. And, and now there's, there's like, there's conservative outlets I don't even have on my cable outlet. I have to, you have to go find if you want to find them. Like nobody trusts news anymore. And, 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 and when you even bring up news, like then there's the question of sourcing. Well, who, where did you get that from? And, and who do you get that from? And it can cause division. Uh, in the body of Christ, division among the people of God. It, it's even coming in the form of the vaccine that's currently being rolled out here in America. I, uh, the, there's anti-vaxxers that, that stand against vaccines and always have. And then there's people that are, have been praying for this vaccine and see it as a, a miracle and a sign of God. And then there's everything in between. I got an email from a, a sweet lady 
uh, from our congregation not long ago that had just gotten the vaccine. And uh, she had done her research. She had some concerns and some of the concerns you've heard and other people have heard, she researched it out and felt confident and comfortable moving forward because of her situation and her family to move forward with getting the vaccine. And, and as she did that, she wasn't very necessarily vocal about it. She just went and got it. But there was, there was other mature believers around her that were very vocal and anti-vaccine. And she sent me this sweet email just asking, pastor, I need to know, do I need to repent for getting the vaccine? What is it in us where we have our opinions so strong and so divided that it causes someone to want to repent for getting a vaccine. See, see, all of this uh, at happening at a time where the church has been limited because of the pandemic to meet together, even what's happening right now because of weather. Uh, we've never had two Sundays in the span of six weeks, seven weeks, where we've had to shut things down because of weather, but here we are. And when you don't have proximity with one another and you don't get to look at someone in the eyes or sit next to them or grab them and say, hey, could you clarify when you said this, when you posted this, when you did this, when you, like all of the sudden the church as a whole, not just mid cities, I'm talking about the big C churches starts to feel those divisions. And what's dividing the country is also really in many ways starting kind of to divide the body of Christ, the church. And, and, and it's all happening in a context where there's more isolation than there's ever been. And there's lots of opportunities everywhere we look to be divided, isn't there? You've run into it, I've run into it. That is where the enemy wants us. And as I think about this, um, I think about a, a, an illusionist. You, you ever see those illusionists, those magic trick people, right? They, they do those fascinating tricks. They'll have a, a, some cards, right? Or, and, and you pick a card and they do all these things with them and they bring that very card that you chose, right? And, and, and you know, if you've done some searching on this, I've gone down the rabbit hole before I will confess uh, on YouTube of finding out how these illusionists do these tricks. It's fascinating to me. And you can go online, you can find out kind of the behind the scenes. And what they'll tell you is they use distraction. They will, they will try to draw your eyes and your attentions up here and use the assumptions that you have. And all the while, while you're looking over here, they'll be doing something over here. And, and as you do this, what, what you're really seeing isn't reality, but what you don't see is reality. Does this make sense? This is what illusionists or magic trick folks do, magicians do, right? And I was thinking about this as it pertains to this. I think this is what the enemy wants. As long as we're so, so focused on all of the things that are dividing the nation, the things that are dividing the country, the things that are dividing the world, and yes, even are beginning to, in many ways, divide the church in some way. As we're focused on those things, there's some real truth that we're missing. There's something real that's going on that we're not seeing. And that's what I think of when I think of the unity of the Spirit, because it grieves me to consider that that there is division in the body of Christ. Um, it, it, it should grieve you too. This is something that we know isn't necessarily right at all, but, but there's a unity of spirit, something true, something good, something pure that needs to be focused on that isn't getting the attention because the attention is out here with all the distractions and the illusions. I'm not saying those things aren't important. I'm just saying there's something bigger. There's something more. There's something deeper, I believe. And unity of the spirit is something Jesus cared tremendously about. Matter of fact, if you have your Bible, look at John 17. And here in a moment, we're gonna move over to 1 Corinthians 13 here in just a second. And we're gonna see that Jesus cared so deeply about the spirit that before he goes to the cross in his, uh, what is often known as the priestly prayers, he begins to pray in John 17. And we get to kind of peek behind the curtain into Jesus's conversation with the father. He actually prays for unity. In John 17, verse 20, it says this, I do not ask for these only, Jesus says, but, on, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he's praying before this for the disciples. And now who's he praying for? 
those who will believe. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. He's praying for uh, the, the one who responded to Christ in, in California or in Texas or New Mexico. Somebody who responded to Christ to the word of truth in Honduras or, or El Salvador or in uh, various countries in Europe and China. Those who will believe in me through their word that they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I pray that they would be one. I pray that those who are gonna believe in Midland, Texas, Odessa, Texas, that they would be one. I pray that those who believe in the house churches in China would be one. I pray that those... Who, who believe, whether they worship at a, a Baptist church or a charismatic church or a, 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 a churches of Christ that, that lift up the name of Jesus Christ, that they would be one as you and I are one as he prays us to the Father. Matter of fact, this is so important uh, that, that they be one as the Father are one. The reason why is so that so that also we may be one so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Why it matters so much that there's unity, that those who believe would be one, is so that, so that the world, that means all those who don't believe, all those who are not in the family of God, all those who are not Christians, the world may believe that you, Father, have sent me, just as Jesus speaking here. See, the unity of the Spirit in the Christians, in the believers, is actually an apologetic for the gospel. It's an apologetic for the gospel. It means it's proof that it's legitimate. It's proof that it's real, that God came. God came and, and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to do what we couldn't do, to live a life we couldn't live, and to die the death we should have died in, died in our place. And then three days later, conquering death and hell, proving he is who he said he was, the very son of God raised from the dead, offers forgiveness and and, and, and eternal life for everyone who would believe. The, 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 fact that, the fact that there's unity among people that are so varied and so different between men and women, between various ethnicities, between slave and free, between poor and rich, all of these things would be a sign. This oneness together would be a sign that, man, God really did do something. He really sent Jesus and if Jesus cared so much about this, at the end of his life, right before he goes to the cross, he's praying for this unity. He prays for his disciples and then he prays for me and he prays for you, that we may be one. See, this is important because unity of spirit is not uniformity. Unity of spirit is not uniformity of, of background or ideas or perspectives. As a matter of fact, it's a unity is, of spirit is we, where we are all looking and moving towards the common object of our faith, who is Jesus. See, this is why the Jews and the Greeks could all get together in the New Testament revival in Acts in Acts, we see this revival, this move of God that's going on. And, and, and it's amazing. It expanded from Jews and then it expanded out to Samaritans and it, it expanded out to Gentiles. And one of the biggest issues that they dealt with during that time is would, could they even eat together? Doesn't that, doesn't that sound crazy? Like today, you're going to sit down with your family. You're going to sit down with some friends. You're going to have a meal. And you're not going to think twice about maybe who's there, right? But what if you called up that person that just made you mad on Facebook the other day or that person on Twitter that you've been watching or, or that pundit on the news that you just hate and love to hate. What if they sat down with you at dinner? Would you eat with them? See, there was a, the meals themselves were miracles in the first century church. The meals themselves were miracles. It was, it was amazing what happened with them in this moment. See, this is why Jesus did just this. He, he says that he wants them to be one just as the Father is one. And when we do it, it shows to the world, man, the legitimacy of the gospel. So how do we do that? How do we maintain this oneness? How do we maintain this unity of the Spirit? 
That's a great question. I want to answer it in, in two ways. The first, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but it's probably the most important. It's this, that we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author of Hebrews says. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. See, if, if Jesus is our focal point, if he's the one we're following, then whether you come from a, a rich or a poor, for men or women, whether no matter what race or, or ethnicity you come from, all of us, no matter where we come from, are coming to the same place. And it doesn't matter. Unity of spirit isn't all coming from the same place. It's going to the same place. Does this make sense? We're going to Jesus because our eyes are on him. And we must keep our eyes on Jesus. And it's hard to do when there's all the lot of distractions that are dividing everybody. But this is important. This is why we, we've called in this series us to repentance. It's why we say we got to be in the word of God. And we got to be men and women of prayer that are keeping our eyes on that. Not keeping our eyes on the news and social media and everything else that can so easily divide us but we got to keep our eyes on Jesus so that we're going in the same place. Otherwise, we're going to fall into division. But the second aspect of this is not just that. It's, it's actually more. The second aspect of this uh, is that we're to obey Jesus' command. So this, this obedience to Jesus' command, we find in John 13. So uh, you don't have to turn there. If you have your Bibles, I'm just going to bring it right up here. John 13, 34 is where we find this command. And here's what Jesus says. A new command I give you, that you love one another. Now, hold on. This doesn't seem very new because if you go to the Old Testament, we're supposed, you know, love your neighbor as yourself was there. But Jesus is, is telling him, hey, I want, you, I, I want you to look at this afresh. I'm giving you a new command. I want you to love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people, you will know that you are my disciples if you love love for one another. This sounds just like what we read a moment ago, doesn't it? <laughs> In John 17, they're gonna, the world's gonna know that, that you sent me, Jesus says, if they love one another. And here he says, the whole, all, all people will know that you're my disciples if you actually have unity, if you love one another. If you want unity of spirit, there's gotta be love. Well, here we are on Valentine's Day talking about love. We didn't even plan this, but this is how it goes, right? Love one another. And here we go, okay, what does this look like to love one another? See, love one another is actually a command that you love one another. It's a command. I mean, think about this for a moment. Um, when we think about love, this actually is a little bit challenging because we, the meaning of love in today's culture and our society is, has really morphed into more of emotionalism and feelings, hasn't it? Like, do you feel this love for someone, what you feel? And we describe how we feel about someone when we're talking about love. But, but it's weird to command someone to have an emotion if that's what love is, right? Like, if you, t if you told me, I want you to feel joy for Tom Brady. I'd say, no way, man. No way. Tom is married to like some, some model. He's got like 50,000 Super Bowl rings, MVPs. He's like 3,000 years old and somehow he's still playing. And it irritates me. I hated the Patriots and now I hate Tampa Bay. And he took Mahomes' championship. Just, just tell me you're getting riled up. Just but what if you told me you got to feel joy for him? You got to feel joy for him. That was a command. That'd be hard. It's hard to command someone to feel something. It's hard to command somebody to have an emotion, right? But it's clear when Jesus tells us to love one another, he's not commanding you to have an emotion. He is commanding you to have an action. Matter of fact, we see this clearly played out. We must understand love biblically. See, we can't understand love as the world calls. When we just say love one another, it sounds so trite. But we've got to understand what does the Bible actually say about love? And one of the first things it says, if we'll go back to John 13, 34 through 35, it says that just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. So the first thing we learn about love from this passage is that Jesus himself modeled love. And we know that Jesus loved himself to death. He loved us so much that he died and he sacrificed. That's what love is. Love is sacrificial to Jesus. 
Jesus talks about love in another place like this. He says, greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friend. Now that's sacrificial. See, sacrifice, when we, feeling an emotion isn't sacrificial. But when we're choosing to love someone, sometimes we choose to sacrifice. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Moms, some of you have sacrificed a career so you can love on these kids. Dads, sometimes you've sacrificed promotions and you've sacrificed climbing up the ladder because that family means so much to you. Some of you, you've sacrificed um, big, big things for other people that you love. Some of you are caring for your elderly parents and they're in the latter years of their life and it's hard right now. It's so difficult. But they loved you for so long and you know you're called to it and you're, and you're just putting your effort into it and you're loving on them. It's not an emotion. This is a, this is a choice. It's a sacrifice. For God loved the world so much that he sent his son, John 3, 16 says. See, in God's world, in the world of Jesus, listen, love is sacrifice. Don't let the world lie to you and say it's some cheap emotion, that it's some feeling. No, no, no. Love is a choice. It's a command. And Jesus models it. So our first clue is this, that just as I have loved, you were to love. So we got to love like Jesus. We got to love sacrificially. But then the second clue is found in 1 Corinthians 13. This is a well-known passage. Turn over there if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting verse 4. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this. Paul was writing to the church at Corinth and they had some problems. Can you imagine for a moment a church that has problems? <laughs> I don't know if you've been in church for a while, but if you stay here long enough in mid-cities or you go anywhere else, you're going to discover churches have problems. Matter of fact, they did in the first century and they do today. And I know that there's difficulty and we're even talking about division and unity right now. But let me just tell you, um, the, the demise of the church is greatly exaggerated. The church is constantly both declining and moving forward throughout history. This is true of the church. It will be true of the church because it's the kingdom of God and it's going to move forward. But it doesn't mean it's perfect. Matter of fact, it has lots of flaws. And if you want to know more about them, just come and find me. I'll tell you. I'll begin with me. And then we can go kind of expand from there. I mean, the church has issues. And the church in Corinth was no exception. They had issues. They had problems. There was rivalries. And there was envy and boasting. And there were, they were, they were uh, very fluent in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but their, their gatherings were kind of out of control and they didn't honor and love one another in them. And they, they kind of gotten into some spiritual pride and um, mixed up with some stuff. There was some, some sexual immorality going on with some of them. I mean, it was a mixed bag, just like probably any church, almost anywhere. And Paul call, writes them to address these things. And he talks here about love. Now, this passage is actually used um, in marriages. If, you, if you've been in weddings, they, they oftentimes read this passage. It's, it's used all the time and, and to talk about marriage and about loving one another in a romantic setting. But the actual context isn't marriage. It's absolutely applicable to marriage, but it's really not about marriage. It's about brothers and sisters in the household of God. It's about, it's about people getting along who um, maybe come from different backgrounds and believe different things at times and, and maybe don't have the same perspective all the time about, about various subjects that are going on in the day. And, and as a matter of fact, um, uh, this, is, this is his appeal for them to engage and define love. Now, here's what we also know. It's not in emotive terms that we discover love here, but in active terms. There are 15 verbs mentioned in this passage that we're going to look at. 15 verbs. If you remember your grammar, a verb is action. A verb takes action. And this is exactly what Paul's trying to, con to, to communicate as he tells them that, that love is more important than all the gifts of the Spirit. Love is more important than knowledge. And uh, uh, love is more important than sacrifice and all these other things you could do. Love is what matters. And then he really dives into the details to tell us what love is. That's what I want to look at. Let's look at it for a moment here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
First of all, it says love is patient and kind. I want us to look at that together. Love is patient and kind. This is what love is. It, it, it engages. This is a positive uh, aspect of love. It is love waits. Love doesn't push in front of the line. Love doesn't demand, but love is patient and kind. And I think about God's kindness and how it leads us to repentance. I was thinking about his kindness and his patience um, this week, actually. My daughter, Anna, was uh, called from, we got a call because she's had some drainage and, and she wasn't feeling good. She was complaining and I had a busy day and Kayla had a busy day and we had to figure it out and juggle whatever it is we had to do to, to, to accommodate. And this is what happens when you have kids, right? Because you love and you sacrifice and, and all of that. But there's an irritate. I mean, come on, can I get any honest parents? You're a little bit irritated. You had all these things going on. You had all this planned and here you got to go deal with this. And it'd be one thing if you were to go, just get her checked out. But now with the pandemic and COVID, you got to get a COVID test before you got to go get her to the doctor. So no, now you're calling, you know, six, eight nurse and they got to shove a big, you know, swab up her nose, which she loves that. And after I calm her down from that, then we go and, and we're kind of quarantined in a room to see the doctor. And then they get to check her for, for, you know, strep throat. And then she's just that, that the massive swab down the throat, that's not going great. And, and my sweet daughter who, as any kid has her own challenges, like everybody I'm just watching her in that moment and think this is supposedly inconveniencing me and it's hard. We've got so many things to do, but I just think about how God is so kind with me when I mess up his plans. I think about the mercy of God. I was just stroking her hair in that doctor's office, thinking about the mercy of God in my life and how patient he's been with me when I I don't understand, when I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm flailing and I'm trying to figure it out. I'm just a kid in his house. Oh, but he's been so patient and kind to me. Matter of fact, his, his, his big, he's so big and he's so amazing, he's so powerful, but you know what brought me to repentance? It's his kindness that draws me to repentance. See, love, when we love someone, it's, it's patient and it's kind. Just like our father is patient and kind with us, we see this theme throughout scripture that God is a God who is patient and kind. It says then there's several here that that speaks in negative terms of what love actively is not. Love does not envy and or it does, does it boast. This was an issue going on right here in the Corinthian church. There was pride and spiritual pride and there was envy of one another. It says, no, no, love doesn't do that. Love doesn't play the comparison game. It is not arrogant or rude Meaning, man, I got it all figured out and I'm gonna speak in such a way that everyone around me feels little and everyone around me feels stupid for believing what they believe or knowing what they know. And I've got it all figured out because I read this article, because I read somebody's opinion over here. I'm arrogant and I'm rude and I got it all figured out. And this was something going on in the Corinthian church. But Paul is saying that's love is not this. Love is not arrogant and is not rude and it doesn't treat people as little, but it treats them as significant, it's patient and it's kind. It does not insist on its own way. Love doesn't say it's my way or the highway. My love doesn't say get on or get off. Love says, hey, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk with you and we're gonna figure this thing out together because see, when we're loving, the spirit of unity means we're, we're, we're loving people in the way God's called us to love people. I'm talking about other Christians. And if we're following Jesus together, he's gonna deal with the junk I'm taking to Jesus. He's gonna deal with their junk too. And you, it's not your responsibility to get all their junk off of them to get to Jesus. You know, we just go to Jesus together and we encourage each other, don't give up, let's keep going after Jesus. Love doesn't insist on its own way. No, 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 you gotta walk behind me. No, you gotta walk with me in this way. No, 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 love does not insist. Love is not irritable. <laughs> oh man. 
I, I've been irritable. I think all the things we just talked about, I'm tired of masks. I'm, I'm tired of, of, of arguing about stuff. I'm tired of people arguing. And, and when you see all of this division going on, it makes you irritable. And then when you're irritable, you snap. Come on, somebody. Is anybody real out there? Irritable. And this is a big one. It's not resentful. Oh, man. Love, love, love doesn't resent someone. So I can't believe them. I can't believe they would do this or say that or be this. Or I, 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 I start talking about it. I'm just all of a sudden the, the resentment because of a perceived offense or perceived uh, maybe a perception of someone, even if we haven't even talked to them because we found out from somebody else or, or we saw what they, they did in social media or maybe we had a conversation. They didn't say hi to us and all of a sudden we start building up a fence. And when we have a fence, that offense grows into resentment and that resentment keeps us so far from loving them the way God wants us to. It is not irritable. It's not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. We don't celebrate sin no matter who does it and where it is. We don't try to justify sin. We don't try to justify the wrongdoing. We don't celebrate it because that's what not love. That's not love. We rejoice in the truth. This is what it is. We rejoice in the truth. The truth, which is God's word. The truth about what God says about a situation. Matter of fact, the Bible defines wisdom as God's perspective. And there's worldly wisdom and then there's godly wisdom. And God's perspective, his wisdom, that's where we find truth. You're not gonna find truth in some news outlet. There's, there's true things they report and untrue things, I'm sure. You're not gonna find tr- news on just some, some platform. You're not gonna find that. You're not gonna just find truth from some conversation with a friend, but truth comes from the word of God and, and, and we rejoice in the truth. God loves truth and does not rejoice in wrongdoing. And then Paul shifts here and he says, hey, hey, not only this, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what love is again. And he says, love bears all things. Have you had somebody love you in a way that they bear things with you? You were sick and they came and bared that sickness with you. You had loss and they came and they walked with you through your mourning." They, they didn't leave you to your own devices, but they came alongside you. They called and they texted and they checked up. And love, Paul is saying, is when you bear with one another. You, you're on the journey together. You say, hey, 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 let me help you with that. We're, we're trying to get to Jesus. We're following him together. Let me, let me bear up under this with you and we're gonna go all together. They bear all things. Believes all things. Not just everything that comes down the pike, but as it pertains to faith and works in Jesus Christ. <laughs> True love believes. The, the, the picture here is, is, is that we want the best for people, not the worst for people. You get the idea. You want, you want them to succeed. Not, and we believe in them and we believe in the truth. Hopes all things, endures all things, which is connected to patience. He's, love is patient. And so love endures. It doesn't believe, love doesn't believe in disposable relationships. Love never ends. And the NIV says love never fails. Look at all of these verbs. These are things that love does. See, it's our job to maintain the spirit of unity in God's family. Um, and we do it through loving biblically. See, when we, when we love in this way, when we, we use this as our, not the world's definition of emotions and political correctness and, 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 and uh, feelings and those kind of things, but when we love in this way, oh, let me, let me just tell you, there's something so unifying when somebody comes and bears up with you. Somebody that, that has an opportunity to be arrogant or rude, but doesn't, walks in a humility and says, you know what? I know love walks in humility for we're gonna do that together. See, we do it through loving biblically. 
we repent whenever we have elevated ourselves above others. We repent of it. We turn from it. Say, man, I've, I've lifted up my opinion. I've lifted up my way before others. Where there is disagreement, we go to the person and we seek understanding and reconciliation. We don't talk about them. We don't harbor the resentment. If there's misunderstanding, we, we go to them, we seek them out as Matthew 28 instructs us to and we become reconciled to them. Why? Because unity of the Spirit's at stake and the love that Jesus has called us to and the love that he's loved us with and the way he deals with us. See, when we fall, when we fail, when we mess up, God doesn't write us off. God doesn't just ignore us. God doesn't disappear from us. He doesn't ghost us on texting. No, no, no. God shows up and he engages us and there's an opportunity for for reconciliation. See, we understand that relationships are not disposable. We understand that, that when uh, God puts us in a spiritual family or he connects us with other believers and, and that, that there's, a, there's a responsibility not just about yourself and your own walk with God in this season, but you have a responsibility to your brothers and sisters too. There's somebody you haven't seen in a while. You need to call them and you need to check on them. Maybe they need you to bear up with them some things that they're walking through. See, when we're, we're drawn into distractions and arguments that cause us to become unloving, as Jesus put it in Mark 9, 42 through 50, it says we are to cut it off. Jesus says very clearly in Mark 9 that if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, it says. What does that mean? It means that, man, there's things in our lives that cause us to become unloving and overly love ourselves and not love others in the way that Bible describes love. And whatever those things are, it's time to cut them off. It's time to cut off social media. If social media is making you irritable, if social media is saying, I've got to insist on my way, if social media is telling you, hey, uh, I may, I'm becoming arrogant or rude about what I know, uh, or, or it, it's keeping you from hoping and enduring in this way, let me just tell you, man, cut it off. Maybe you have some friendships or relationships to draw you into. It. Maybe it's just regular media and filling your eyes and your ears with things. Let me just tell you, be careful, be wary of it because, man, it's in these things that, that we begin to give up the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So Daniel, what do I do? So close today. What do I do right now? It's very simple. You gotta love somebody. Well, Daniel, you're sounding like, like a Michael Jackson song, right? You're sounding like some crazy song, you know, love, love, love's the answer. You just need to love. No, 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 I really mean it. I mean, I'm not talking about the world's love and some emotion. I'm talking about it's time to who needs your patience and kindness right now? Who needs you to bear things up? If you found yourself resentful towards others, because maybe this is not just you loving them, but maybe it's maybe, maybe just maybe that when we, when we take love seriously, we begin to create an atmosphere where revival can thrive, where God's spirit can move, where he can begin to, to call us into deeper levels of prayer and connection and community. We become the answer to Jesus's prayer in John 17. Jesus is praying, oh, I pray that they're one as you and I are one, Father. And when they're one, the whole world's gonna know that you really sent me. And as Jesus is praying this, you and I, when we, we strive to love one another, despite even differences and, and, and thoughts and, in, a, in a season, knowing that the enemy wants to distract and divide us more than anything, because let me just tell you, what he fears more than anything is a church that's centered on Christ, that's where our focus point is on Christ moving forward with the gospel and the kingdom of God that doesn't just change laws, but changes hearts. And once hearts are changed, then a whole bunch of things get changed once hearts change. And this is what the enemy is so afraid of. He's afraid of the church being the church. And let me just tell you, there's a bunch of fear. There's a bunch of anxiety. There's a bunch of worry. And there's even some offense and resentment out there in the 
in the church world. I'm not just talking about here. I'm talking about everywhere. This is, it's there. And let me just tell you, God's answer for it is decide it's not time to feel something. It's time to do something. And as I speak to you right now, as you're in your living room, you're in your truck, you're in a hotel room somewhere, on a day where we can't meet because of weather for the second time in six, seven weeks, so frustrating. We can't even be together. Here's what we can do. We can ask God right now, God, would you show me what relationships I need to make right today. God, who do I need to love on today? Not who needs to love you and who needs to come and make things right with you. Well, I, I'm gonna send some passive aggressive text and make sure they know I'm not happy. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, let's, let's set that aside for a moment. Let's just ask, who do you need to initiate with and make right? What relationships need to be made right right now? I want to tell you, don't wait. You're stuck at home. There's ice, snow. Why not reach out to somebody? Why not, why not tell them, man, I, I'm sorry, I repent. I, I've been holding resentment against you. I've been, I've been frustrated and anger about, and I haven't even sought understanding from you. And I want to do that. Can we have some coffee or Maybe if you're, you're in a compromised situation, you can get on Zoom and just talk face to face, even digitally. But let me just tell you, this is the time. If we want God to do something great, it's gonna be in a, a place where we're going to the same place and that same place is not a place necessarily, but a person and that person is Jesus. And we're going with everybody else and we're choosing, we're going to choose the action, the verb. We're going to love one another. And as we do, we're going to maintain the unity. And there's what Ephesians calls the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We're going to walk in humility with one another. We're going to consider others better than ourselves. And we're going to see God do amazing things in mid-cities and in your family and in my family and in our cities. So God, we invite you to do it. We invite you to come and move in power. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We honor you. Father, help us to know exactly the person, maybe it's one person that we need to engage in. Father, help us, help us know and see clearly what you see about where we're at spiritually and where we're not, where we need to love. And Father, I just pray that you would find here in this place group of people committed to you because we've received so much kindness, so much love. We can't help but take that love that you've given us and share it with everyone around us. Father, we love you and we trust you. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen.